Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Green Building Media's Impact Series, Game Changers in Sustainability. Apologize for the delay, we'll be with you in just a couple of seconds. Hello and welcome back to another edition of the Impact Series, Game Changers in Sustainability. I wanted to start off by wishing all our architect friends a happy World Architecture Day. Hope you're enjoying your day. And among other month-long events, it's also Lung Cancer Awareness Month. And that's going to have some relevancy to today's discussion as we talk about how to reduce or even eliminate the use of hazardous materials at the design stage of a materials process. Our guest today is Dr. John Warner from the Warner Babcock Institute for Green Chemistry. Now, while everyone gets their lab coats and safety goggles on, I wanted to tell you that today's webinar would not be possible without the support of our generous sponsors. And those sponsors are Owens Corning, build higher performance homes with Owens Corning, and the Green Builder Coalition. The Green Builder Coalition offers in-depth research and technical information, as well as national and state advocacy resources. The coalition is also the home of the Green Building Administrator, the industry's only software program that allows you to compare the three major national green building programs. For more information on our membership levels, please visit www.greenbuildercoalition.org and click on Member Benefits. I'm Mike Kalignan, Executive Director of the Green Builder Coalition, and I'm sitting in for Ron Jones today, so I'll be your host and moderator for today's webinar. Now, during the course of today's presentation, you could submit questions for our guest at any time. To do so, simply use the small box at the bottom of the q and I'll review those questions and pose them to John at the end of his presentation. And now to introduce our guest. Dr. John Warner is the recipient of the 2014 Perkin Medal, widely acknowledged as the highest honor in American industrial chemistry. He received his Bachelor's of Science in Chemistry from University of Massachusetts, Boston, and his PhD in chemistry from Princeton. John worked at the Polaroid Corporation for nearly a decade, after which he was a tenured full professor at University of Massachusetts Boston and University of Massachusetts Lowell, teaching chemistry and plastics engineering. In 2007, he founded the Warner Babcock Institute for Green Chemistry, LLC, where he serves as president and chief technology officer. He also founded Beyond Benign, a nonprofit dedicated to sustainability and green chemistry education. He is one of the founders of the field of green chemistry, and he co-authored Green Chemistry, Theory and Practice with Paul Anastas. He has published over 200 patents, papers, and books. Warner has won numerous awards, including the 2004 Presidential Award for Excellence in Science Mentoring. Warner was named by ICIS as one of the most influential people impacting the global chem chemical industries. And finally, in 2011, he was elected a Fellow of the American Chemical Society and named one of 25 Visionaries Changing the World by Utney Reader. John, welcome to the Impact Series. Well, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to, to be here today and to, to go through you know, something obviously I have very near and dear to my heart. I welcome the people who are, who are on the line now listening, and, and I look forward to uh, answering your questions at the end of this. Um, essentially, my goal here is to provide a foundational background to green chemistry to help put in perspective what it is and what it isn't uh, in the world of sustainability. And so, you know, if you think about it, you know, we're in a in difficult time when it comes to chemicals in the environment. You turn on the radio, you open up a newspaper, you look on the internet, and you hear about all the nasty things going on, molecules that, you know, cause cancer, that this molecule is going to hurt us, this molecule is scary, this molecule is bad, this is toxic, this is dangerous, this is scary, this is bad, this is dangerous, this is awful. And we're learning, and it's, we're inundated with this information about, you know, the nasties of chemistry. It's almost like the game whack-a-mole, you know, this, this carnival game where the little guy comes up and you hit it on its head and then it goes down in another one. The, what is the mascot 
of the American Chemical Society. It's actually a mall, isn't it? We're playing whack-a-mole when it comes to toxic materials, right? We hear about brominated flamatidins, whack. We hear about phthalates, whack. We hear about bisphenol A, whack. And we're breathless when we're chasing this molecule, and we're chasing this molecule, and we're nervous. We're saying, gee, is it really that toxic? Or maybe it's not so bad, but we don't have time to figure it out because the next issue is coming up, and we're, we're, rest, we're, we're tired, we're exhausted, and we're trying to figure out should we be afraid or should we not be afraid? How serious is this? How not serious is this? And it gets really frustrating. And what we can't do is we can't allow this to create a sense of despair because it's too important of a situation to just allow despair. You know, it, can you imagine if Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King got up and said, I have a nightmare, you know, Maybe people would have written checks, because people write checks to despair, but they don't get up out of their seat and do things. And what we really need to do is focus on the high road here, that this is not a despair. This is, there's got to be a positive way to do it. So what, you know, I, I look at it and I say, are we really asking the right questions? Let's accept as a fact that there are materials that are potentially toxic and dangerous out there, that there are maybe red dyes that cause cancer, that there are plasticizers that cause birth defects, that there are monomers that are endocrine disruptors. Maybe we're asking the wrong question. Instead of focusing on the molecules and asking, is this toxic, is this bad, is this toxic, is this bad, there is a far more fundamental question we should be asking. Why would a chemist make a hazardous material in the first place? Isn't really, at the end of the day, that the big question? Why would someone make something toxic and hazardous? And so maybe instead of talking about and asking questions about how we make molecules, maybe the first fundamental question should be, how do we make chemists? And maybe there's some insight there. Now, I am a chemist. All right. I am not a historian. I am not a sociologist. I can't go and quote the history of chemistry and certain facts about that, but I myself became a chemist. Maybe there's some insight in how I was trained as a chemist that has some universal application. So let's look at that for a second. So I am, grew up in the city of Quincy, Massachusetts, south of Boston, the home of two you know, U.S. presidents, John Adams and John Quincy Adams, tons of quarries, many granite buildings in the East Coast were built from quarries out of Quincy, Massachusetts, and there was, in fact, a Nobel laureate from chemis in, in chemistry from Quincy, Massachusetts, a guy named Robert Burns Woodward, <clears throat> got the Nobel Prize in 1965. Now, I grew up not being a, a junior chemist. When I was in the second grade, no, I didn't own a chemistry set. I didn't dream of becoming a chemist. In fact, you know, I come from a, a huge Sicilian family. Was I had 47 first cousins with a one-mile radius growing up. And we were, were tradespeople, carpenters, plumbers, electricians. We didn't really fully, you know, understand this whole concept of, of, of college and universities. You know, I, in my, in, as a high school student, had nothing to do with science. I was a musician, went to Quincy High School, played in the marching band and in the jazz band. In fact, I was voted class musician. And, you know, to me, a higher education was when I took, you know, English on the second, second floor of the high school. I had no idea what college and universities were. No one in my family, that's not what we were. And so when I went to college, I kind of shocked my family by saying, I, I'm going to go to university. But I went to UMass Boston, not as a scientist, as a music major. And I played in this band called The Elements, of all things. Now, I promise you, this had nothing to do with carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen. You know, you can see there's a, one guy holding a Rubik's Cube, another a glass ball. Those were the elements. You know, hey, it was the late 70s. What do you want? Uh, well, anyways, The Elements were fairly successful. We were playing music, you know, quite regularly in, in the dives in Boston. We actually had a recording contract, and things were going pretty well when disaster hit, and the drummer of the band ended up getting leukemia, and over the course of six months, he passed away. Now, here I am, an undergraduate music major at UMass Boston. I had to take other classes other than music to graduate. I had to take a math class, a science class, a foreign language. And so for my science class, I really couldn't pick between biology and physics. I 
thought biology was cool, genetics and things like that. I thought physics was cool, quarks and subatomic particles. And in my indecision of not being able to pick between biology and physics, I added them up, divided by two, and I said, oh, I'll take chemistry and split the difference. And so I was taking chemistry as a music major when one day this professor, Professor Jean-Pierre Anselm, came into the teaching lab, looked at me, music major, walked by, and went to the student next to me and invited him to do research in his lab. I overheard the conversation. The band was not playing because I just lost the drummer, my friend. And so I said, can I come? And I went into the research lab, and I'm going to tell you this in the end. All of a sudden, the world changed because my whole life was much good at music. I was an artist. In the world, there were types of people, artists and science. And I was on the artist side. I never occurred to me what science was because I'm an artist. When I found that what chemists really did, that they made things, that they created things, that they invented things, it threw my world in a kind of a turmoil. I said, well, Jesus, that's not really about art and science, creativity, imagination, making things. And it came to this epiphany that art and science had nothing to do with creativity. Those were human contracts that were created to divide the world for whatever purpose with a reductionist approach. But really, I, I had this idea that if you ran my brain through the electrodes and I composed a piece of music on a piano keyboard or I drew a molecule on a blackboard designing, I said, I bet you the same neurological pathway fire that creating something new had nothing to do with the word art and science, in that once I could understand that, I got into chemistry really a lot and started to you know, work in the lab 30, 40, 50, 60 hours a week. I, in fact, I actually published five papers as an undergraduate before I was 20 years old, spoke at national meetings in Washington and all over the place, and really got into it. In fact, I made the cover of Celebrity Magazine <laughs> of all things, Boy George. That's not a claim fame. What one day I, I got a phone call from this magazine. So John Wanna with your Boston Eston Brightest College graduate I'm gonna be a picture take it. And I hung up the phone and said, No. They called me back a couple minutes later, really we want you to do this and I said, No. And the next day I'm working construction full time after the university, I'm not shaving, I'm wearing a, a lousy shirt and the chancellor of the university comes to my lab and says, You will go get your picture taken. So there I am, you know, all nasty and, and with all these snappy dressed happy people and I'm there hating life and they do the story about this kid who's synthesized over a hundred new molecules that have never existed existed in the world before, assembling atoms in unique geometry that God never intended. And I'm looking at this, and I'm reading this article, and I said, huh, I'm a chemist. How did that happen? And next thing you know, I find myself at Princeton University working on anti-cancer chemotherapy. I worked with this brilliant guy named E.C. Taylor and had a great group and was part of a large team that ultimately came up with this drug called the Olympta. Olympta is sold by the Eli Lilly Company, and it's one of the most successful anti-cancer drugs for solid tumors in history. In fact, you know, just to show you the relationship between science and society, you know, you know, a decade ago I lost my mom, lung cancer. She was receiving a derivative of a drug that I had to think with a lot of other people 50 years earlier. And Princeton has a seven-story chemistry building built entirely on the proceeds of one drug. So Princeton's very happy with all this drug. Um, and one of the co-workers there, Go Punt, was you know with me at that time, and he'll come into the story in a little bit. So here's my lab at Princeton. That's my dad during, you know, during graduation. I never told him I was a graduate student. I told him I was an apprentice. He was okay me going to graduate school, and I called it apprenticeship. And in that lab, he's kind of looking at a telephone, not exactly the model, but something like that. And uh, one day the phone rang. And on the end of the phone was a senior corporate officer from the Polaroid Corporation, a guy named Lloyd Taylor. 
and this guy has been following my career for you know years. He's like, John, I remember when you were in Celebrity Magazine. I remember when you spoke at the National Academy. There was, you know, there was. Um, he he and I, you know, he he said, I'd like to you know meet you for lunch. And at lunch, he offered me the job of working in exploratory research at the Polaroid Corporation. You know, the 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 instant um, instant photograph company. And what was what was fascinating is what the heck do I know about instant photography? I'm a medicinal chemist. So I told him, I said, what would I do at a place like Polaroid? Um, and so what I ended up doing is I said, you know, I can't work there. I, I, I don't know anything about instant photography. And he told me how much he was going to pay me. And I said, when do I start? And next thing you know, I'm working for an instant photograph company. Um, while there, I came up with this 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 other thought. Um, I'm I'm being I'm getting messages, you know, saying that the sound quality is being gobbled. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to talk this way and see if this improves the sound quality. I apologize. I have no feedback. I can't tell if it hears or not. There's awesome storms in the area. I'm on a landline, and so I don't know if there's some gobbling going on because of that. Uh, hopefully, this is a little bit better. So, anyways, at Polaroid. I, you know, I was thinking about manufacturing, chemical manufacturing, and I said, you know, for over 180 years of what we call modern chemistry, we've figured out a lot of good stuff. We make really good molecules. We've got good pharmaceuticals. We've got good, um, you know, electronic devices and materials. But if you think about it, all these things that we make, we manufacture at high temperature, we work under high pressures, and we use harsh reagents to carry out these transformations. If you look out the window at nature, and you see what happens in nature, I would argue that nature outperforms humans, hands down in complexity and diversity, but also does so at room temperature. It manufactures everything uh, in um, room temperature, and it does everything at ambient pressure using water as a solvent for the most part. Huh, why? Why is it that nature is so much better than humans at its what it makes, but not only what it makes, but how it makes it? Well, that's when the next epiphany hit me. And I, I joke and I say, it's a thermometer is a molecular speedometer. What do I mean by that? When we learn chemistry, we learn that molecules have unique geometries. And when they react together and they collide, most of those collisions do not produce a reaction. They just, the molecules bounce off of each other. And that very few times when molecules collide does a reaction have to happen. And so why we heat things up and put things under high pressure we manufacture them is increase the frequency of the collisions so as to enable whatever that we want to have them happen. Now, here's the epiphany. There is never a reactive collision in nature. You think about it, molecule in nature, whether in cells or tissues, whatnot, are in a semi-condensed state where they're not moving freely through solution, but actually have some assembly going on. And in nature, there's never a reactive collision, but instead, <laughs> molecules first kind of snuggle up with each other, attach to each other, then undergo a chemical reaction. And I said, man, that's it. So if we could find ways of doing that in manufacturing, maybe we could do things more efficiently and better. And I called this non-covalent derivatization. So at Polar, I came up with this concept called non-covalent derivatization. The license plate of my car is NCD, so I'm really crazy about this stuff. I won't bore you about the details of this on this call today. But essentially, it was a way of controlling the dissolution kinetics of some materials in Polaroid instant photography. Okay, And so this worked really well. And we actually got some, some inventions into Polaroid instant photography. And in the United States, you can't just manufacture something new. You have to get EPA approval. You have to get what's called the low-volume exemption, a pre-manufacturing notification. 
Now, those two things, you know, this is back before the Internet, okay? So these are bankers' boxes wrapped up and mailed to Washington, D.C. And we waited, and we waited, and we waited, and the EPA ultimately rejected the application, not because of toxicity, not because of environmental impact. They just didn't understand the science. They said, small particles, what are you talking about? Molecular complexes, are you crazy? They had no idea what it was that we were talking about. And so Polaroid put me on an airplane and sent me to Washington to give a seminar to the EPA about non-covalent derivatization. While I was there, you know, I met the branch chief of the Office of Pollution Prevention and Toxics, this guy named Paul Anastas. Wait a minute. I knew him. Remember the student that I followed into the research lab when I was a music major? It was him. He was a friend of mine from, I know, knew him for a long time. In fact, I was playing in a jazz band with his older brother. There's his older brother on the sax. There's me on the keyboard. My older brother was awesome hair. And this guy here, if you've ever been to Las Vegas, he's the guy now today who plays Rod Stewart in Legends in Las Vegas. No, no bearing on this conversation. I, I thought that was kind of cool. So anyways, Paul and I, we, we got to talking, saying, well, isn't it interesting? Polaroid used to make these things by several reaction steps, high energies, hazardous reagents. This non-covalent derivatization has allowed us to do things under aqueous conditions, low energy, non-hazardous reagents. It seems that this is a, a better way to do it. Why is the EPA giving us a hard time for something that's fundamentally better for the environment? And that's when we started thinking about it. I said, well, gee whiz, you know, this is around 1990, 1991. The Pollution Prevention Act had just been enacted. And people were talking about measuring pollution, monitoring pollution, recycling, remediating. And here was a synthetic chemist who came up with a technology that was environmentally benign to begin with. Huh. Do people do that? And that's with the birth of green chemistry was Paul and I saying, gee whiz, you know, Paul already had a green chemistry program that was going on. He said, Here's, here we have a technology that is better for the environment. Do people talk about this? Do people actually think about strategies to make environmentally benign technologies? Well, you know, come to think of it, in 1990, no. There were no journals. There were no classes. There were no textbooks. People weren't communicating the techniques, the molecular level science around how do you make materials environmentally benign. And that was why we came up with this concept of green chemistry. Now, green chemistry, just to be really clear, from my perspective, a technology that is green chemistry is more ben environmentally benign than an alternative, but that's not enough. It also has to work. No one is going to buy a cleaner that doesn't clean if it's, <laughs> if it, even if it's green. And they're not going to pay a premium. It has to have the right cost structure. So for a technology to be green chemistry, it's not enough to be better for the environment or for human health. It's got to work, and it's got to have the right cost structure. If we're forcing society to use inefficient technology that's too expensive, that's not sustainable. And so green chemistry says it's got to do all three. It's got to have the safety, but it also has to have superior performance and superior cost. And that's, the, that's critical for green chemistry. And so Paul and I, we got together and we wrote this book called Green Chemistry Theory and Practice. And I, I get a joke that this book, you know, really kind of a common sense book that anyone could have written. Really, there's nothing earth-shaking in this book. It's an observation of what people can do to, you know, make things more environmentally benign and non-toxic. And I joke that we kind of got turned into Forrest Gump overnight when this book came out. You know, now here it is. It's been translated into 15 different languages. I've been to over 40 countries meeting presidents and prime ministers. And it just seems that this thing was written at the right time in the right place. And it's, it's really got, it's really kind of taken off. But again, like I said, there's nothing earth shaking in this book. Anyone could have written it. It's just we happen to be the ones. The thing that I think is most significant is the 12 principles that are articulated in the book. Because students don't have classes in green chemistry, because no one is learning how to design materials that are non-toxic environmentally benign, we needed to fill that gap. 
And so this is kind of like a how-to list of if you're in the business of making a material, of designing a material, here are the things that you can do to anticipate those real-world implications. And I did a search, you know, now it's almost a year old, but uh, a year ago I did the search looking at the mention of the words green chemistry in the scientific literature. And you can see, although we started talking about it in 1990, you know, the 10-year lag time, and then around 2000, all of a sudden you see this explosion where the green squares are you know, journals and scientific documents mention green chemistry. But what I find really interesting is the blue triangles are the patents. People are actually talking about green chemistry in the patent literature. That's when you know things are happening. I've got to go back to my life story for a second because there's an important new other chapter to this. At this point in my life, you know, I'm working at Polaroid. Things are going pretty well. You know, working on the book, people are talking about green chemistry. When you know, and, and I've been approaching it at this point as mostly an intellectual exercise. I've been saying to myself, "Gee whiz, this is better for business. It makes you more competitive." Blah blah blah. I wasn't really thinking of it from an ethical, moral perspective. It was just it seemed like a smart thing to do. And life has a way of catching up to you. It's kind of interesting. So it's around you know, this time in my Polaroid career when disaster hits in the worst way imaginable. My two-year-old son dies. I lose my two-year-old son, John, to a birth defect called biliary atresia. He was born today is his birthday. All right, and so that's just ironic that today would be that day. But he was born in 1991 with a birth defect called biliary atresia, where his liver was completely detached from his intestines. You can't survive doing that because um, you can't metabolize water and soluble nutrients. So he was given surgery to keep him alive, and we kept him alive for two years, and then we ultimately lost him. Now, the reason that this is so important, because lying awake at night, the evening of his funeral, I asked myself, I wonder if something I touched caused his disease. I'm a chemist. I work in a lab. I wonder if something I invented, maybe I even got an award for, somehow caused his birth defect in his disease. And it really drove me crazy, you know, because I was thinking to myself, well, gee whiz, I had four years of undergraduate. I had three and a half years of graduate school. I'm familiar with books like Our Stolen Future that talk about the impact of chemicals on society. Here it is. I'm in a career where I'm very successful. I've synthesized over 2,500 new molecules, not repeat syntheses, new molecules. And I came to the realization I never had a class in toxicology. I never had a class in environmental mechanisms. Here I am, the most successful chemist I could be, and I have no idea what makes a chemical toxic. I can't answer that question. If I'm asking myself, am I exposing myself or my family to toxic materials, nowhere in my education as a chemist were I given any skills to think about that. Now that I was interested, I'm, I'm Googling and looking at this. There's a certain higher incidence of types of tumors in chemists, elevated breast cancer mortality among professional chemists. There's report after report after report. How is it possible that four years of undergraduate, three and a half years of graduate school, I never had a class, I never had a discussion, nothing? Huh. Every year in the United States, we graduate 15,000 undergraduates, 3,000 masters, and 3,000 doctoral degrees in chemistry. In 2004, we turned the point where more women started to become chemists than men. What could be more important to the field of chemistry than understanding the impact of molecular structure on human health and the environment? And yet, not one university on the planet requires a chemist to take a class in mechanistic toxicology or environmental impact. Why do we have red dyes that cause cancer? Why do we have plasticizers that cause birth defects? Why do we have monomers that are endocrine disruptors? This isn't an epic battle of good and evil. This isn't that companies have solutions, but just because of profit, they're suppressing them. This is something more fundamental and basic. This is, for some weird reason, chemistry has evolved that this isn't part of our job as a chemist. And so someone else comes after we make something and says, hey, that's toxic, that's not toxic. And so the epiphany here is that, well, gee whiz, although this is startling and scary, it also gives us a path to success, right? If we just started training chemists to have a little bit of knowledge in toxicity, environmental impact, maybe we can make a safer world.
And so I left Polaroid after 10 years, and I went to the UMass system, and I started a PhD program in green chemistry. So it's everything in a regular chemistry program, but we added an additional class uh, on toxicology. We added an additional class in um, environmental mechanisms. We added another class on um, law and policy. And you know what? Over the next 10 years, over 120 students participated in this program. The average time it took them to get a job upon graduation was two days. The longest any of these students looked for a job was two weeks uh, because she turned down the first couple of job offers. So this is massively successful because industry say, man, you know, you, you mean you can come in and you can solve a, a, a problem and invent something and you know something about toxicity and environmental impact? Cool. And so even now, 10 years later, I'm still having companies call asking, hey, John, you get any more graduates? And so this is really took off because essentially the way I look at it, is of all the products and processes that we have, maybe 10% is benign. 90% of everything that we do out there, someone's grumpy about. Now, maybe it's a serious problem, maybe not a serious problem, but there's only about 10% of the things have really, truly escaped scrutiny. 90% of them have problems. If we do what's called an alternatives assessment, looking in the supply chain for a different alternative that is better, I believe we'll be successful maybe, at best, 25% of the time. But today in 2014, I would argue 65% of the solutions haven't been invented yet. It's not like companies have the solutions and they choose not to sell them. You know, think about it. If my definition is superior performance, superior cost, and oh, by the way, better for the environment, who in their right mind wouldn't want that? And so I would argue that the only barrier to this is the invention in the first place. And that's where we're at at this point, is we need to come up with ways of inventing the better technologies. So essentially, if if you, if you hear, you know, from a semantic perspective, how does green chemistry fit into the big picture of sustainability? Well, the way I look at it is, um, you know, if you go on the EPA website and you look at green chemistry, they say on the website, green chemistry is also known as sustainable chemistry. When I read this, I drop on the floor in the fetal position and I cry like a baby. I do not agree. Sustainable chemistry is a field that has been around for a lot longer than green chemistry, and green chemistry and sustainable chemistry are not the same things. The way I look at it is sustainability. You can put sustainable before any word and have a, an interesting conversation. Sustainable economics, sustainable agriculture, sustainable education, sustainable business, sustainable chemistry, sustainable engineering, a million of ways that you can break that up. Okay? Under sustainable chemistry, you can talk about chemicals policy. You can talk about remediation technologies, exposure control, green chemistry, water purification, alternative energy, or other ways. So I see green chemistry as a subset of sustainable chemistry. And here's what I mean. The, the, what green chemistry is focused on is it's application agnostic. It's not out what the technology is doing. What is in that technology? What are the ingredients? You can have a solar panel. Solar energy is a sustainable technology, okay? That's important. So, but right now, most solar panels use toxic materials and a ton of energy in their manufacture. So they're not green, but they are sustainable. And so green chemistry is, like I said, app application agnostic, focusing on solvents, the catalysts, the feedstocks, the toxicity, the persistence, the energy use. I have a bias. There are 12 principles, so I would argue there are 12 ways of breaking that up. So green chemistry is a subset of this picture of what is the impact of the building blocks of the, of the technologies. So it's no different. You, you can be talking about green chemistry for you know, designing a toothpaste or a solar energy device. It's not what the, the device does. It's what goes into that device. And so that's where the missing link is. And so my, you know, the fundamental premise is if a product is built from sustainable materials, the product has a good chance of being sustainable. But if you don't have sustainable materials, all the design in the world is not going to make 
a sustainable product. And so green chemistry is that component that gets into that. And so if people are interested in life cycle assessment, what I did was I spread out the life cycle and I took each of the 12 principles across a product's life cycle. If you're in marketing, green chemistry is not really the tool for you. Maybe you can talk about it a little bit. But green chemistry is really about R&D. And that if you're in research and development, all of the principles are designed to work for you. And that's the point of green chemistry. It's not an evaluative tool. It is an R&D tool to design materials that are less you know, you know, impact on human health and the environment. Because we've got to ask ourselves, where do products come from? Okay? We turn molecules into materials, and we call that basic research. We turn materials into components. We call that applied research. We turn components into devices. We call that development. When we do a lot of that, we call that manufacturing. What is important if we're in this business? If we're manufacturing things, we've got to worry about performance. We've got to worry about cost. We've got, hey, wasn't that my definition of green chemistry? The mistake people make is to think green chemistry is something new, when in fact green chemistry is just common sense how we've always been doing things, but it's just adding the environment in the middle of the process. We have to ask ourselves, where did those molecules come from, renewable or depleting resources? When the product is end of, at the end of its useful life, is it going to degrade into innocuous byproducts, or is it going to persist and bioaccumulate? When we manufacture, when we sell, when we use these products, who is the only person who can mitigate the impacts on human health and the environment? the person who designs it in the first place. And if that chemist or engineer has never had a class in toxicology or environmental mechanisms, well, how can they do it? So green chemistry is not the birth of ethics. I would argue that chemists have never heard of green chemistry. Of course they care about human health and the environment. Of course they're moral and ethical. Green chemistry has not created ethics. But we approach things from a different perspective. What we've done historically is we said, okay, chemistry has to be toxic. Chemistry has to be dangerous, but that's okay because we're going to wear gloves to protect our skin. We're going to wear masks to protect our lungs. We're going to wear goggles to protect our eyes. We're going to install scrubbers and filters and smokestacks to protect the air, the land, and the sea. So we've got things covered by mitigating exposure. And that's how we've historically done things. If green chemistry is a revolution, it's saying, well, instead of focusing on exposure, what if we use the tools and ingenuity of chemists to focus on the intrinsic hazard in the first place? If I'm going to make a red dye, and I want it to have a certain color, and I want it to stick to a fabric, and I don't want it to fade in the light, I don't want it to oxidize in the air, oh, and by the way, I also don't want it to be a synergen. Well, I can point to the things I had to talk about the first few of those, but if I've never had a class about what makes a molecule a carcinogen, how can I design it not to be? And so if chemist classes that gave them introduction, not come junior toxicologists, but some introduction to how to find that innation, maybe we could start to say anything that I'm more than I see tonight. Industry gets it. They obviously, if you have a safe technology versus a hazardous technology, it costs a lot more to store a hazardous material, to transport, to treat, to dispose, the regulatory costs, the liability, the work of health and safety, corporate reputation, community relations, new employment recruitment, all of these things, who wouldn't want a safer material? What I did was I went back to 1870 and I tallied up all the environmental regulations in the Federal Register in the United States. You can see not a whole lot happened until 1962. Rachel Carson published Silence Spring, I Was Born, and you see the birth of the modern environmental movement. Here you can see now all of a sudden this graph has changed dramatically, and you see this rapid onset, and it continues to today, of new environmental regulations, new laws. I would argue that one of the single biggest impediments to success commercially is understanding these laws, that to be able to commercialize and, 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 and manufacture something, the highest cost and the biggest roadblock is dealing with new environmental regulations. You know, some companies spend as much money on 
R&D as they do on environmental compliance. You know, there's a major chemical company that spends a billion dollars a year in chemical R&D, and they spend the same amount of money, a billion dollars a year, in environmental compliance. So the CEO of that company wakes up one day and says, from now on, I want my scientists to only invent environmentally benign, non-toxic technologies. We'll save a ton of money. Oh, but none of those chemists have ever had a class in toxicology, have never had a class in environmental mechanisms. So the desire is there. It's the ability that's not. And that's the key, is we need to find a way to close that gap. So the way I look at the world is like a toolbox. We have a toolbox in the chemical enterprises. One drawer is for carbon-carbon bond-forming reactions, one for oxidations, reductions, hydroxylations, polymer synthesis. Essentially, this toolbox is jam-packed. If you can draw a molecule and it doesn't violate some fundamental law, we probably can make it. However, if we imagine a green chemistry toolbox where all of those, those transformations are now environmentally benign, non-toxic, and non-regulated, like I said, this toolbox is about 90% empty. So I believe an individual, a company, a developing country is going to open up the green chemistry toolbox first because it just makes sense. It's, it's, it's more profitable. It's going to be faster to market. There's so many reasons to want it, but odds are the drawer is going to be empty. So what do they do? They can't say, stop everything, let's invent a new technology. That's just not the way the world works. You can't schedule an invention. You can't say, next Tuesday at 2.30, I'm going to invent a new technology. And so all they can do is close the green chemistry draw, open up the traditional, say, okay, what is it going to cost for my gloves, for my masks, the liability costs, the regulatory costs, all that. And they work that into the thing, and they do business as usual because they can't take the time to invent. And so what we need to do is come up with a process where that toolbox is being invented at universities and at institutes so that when companies are looking for the alternative, it exists. And that's the dream of green chemistry. Now, obviously, from a financial perspective, Pike Research published this report a few years ago predicting that in 2020, green chemistry will be a $100 billion industry. Okay, so, you know, industry just gets it. All right. So after 10 years at UMass, I, kind of funny, I, I got an award called the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science Mentoring from the NSF and the President. And I actually spent a half an hour in the Oval Office with President Bush. I don't know which one of us looks more scared in this picture. But uh, after 10 years of being in academia, I realized that there was something missing, that this is not the way to do it. And what I did is I left academia, and this is why. I realized that our society pays more attention to identifying and describing a problem than solving it. What do I mean? You know, I, at this point in time, in 2007, I had published already over 200 patents and papers. I'd probably worked in my life on maybe 50, 60 technologies, making them a little less toxic, a little bit more environmentally benign. And I realized no one's ever heard of any of that work. Nothing. Nobody could, could even list any of the things that he had done. But one day, the day, you know, about three years ago, when Canada banned Nalgene from their plastic bottles because of BPA, Science News called me up and wanted a quote from me about BPA and Canada banning Nalgene. And I was in a mood. I was driving in my car, and I pulled into a parking lot. And I'm sitting in a parking lot, and I'm talking on the phone to this reporter. And it was a grocery store parking lot, and a pregnant woman came out of the grocery store holding some bags, and as she approached her car, she took a cash register receipt and put it in her mouth. And while I'm talking to the reporter, I'm watching this, and I go, you know, what really concerns me is not so much the plastic bottles and the, the femtogram quantities of bisphenol A leaching out from those bottles, I bet you the human exposure to bisphenol A is more from cash register receipts because I knew as an imaging chemist from Polaroid that cash register receipts use free bisphenol A in milligram quantities on the cash register receipt. So I said, I bet you that this is probably where most of the human exposure to bisphenol A might be coming from. Well, next thing you know, they published that. And next thing you know, 
thousands of websites start reporting about John Wanna reveals bisphenol A in cash register receipts. I spent a lifetime of inventing alternative technology. The one time I mentioned a problem, all of a sudden, I've got, I'm on radio shows, television shows, and everybody, even this world famous journal, Women's World, on the same page as a cat pushing a shopping carriage, it says John Wanna reveals bisphenol A. So I become famous for identifying a problem not for solving it. And I go, man, that's not cool. And so I left UMass and I started the Warner Babcock Institute for Green Chemistry and Beyond Benign to focus not on talking about the problems, but inventing the solutions. And man, is this is if you know, it's just a dream come true place. I met this man, Jim Babcock, who he and I cooked up this idea and we created a forty two thousand square foot research facility with every piece of chemical equipment that you could possibly imagine to synthesize small molecules and polymers to fabricate devices, test devices, and just iterate as an invention factory. And it's just a dream come true. And although the toys are fun and great, it's the people that are Amazing. It's just that, you know, 36 of the greatest people here working, just doing doing the coolest stuff. And to give you an example, some examples of some of the things we're doing. I mean, we're all over the place. We have some pharmaceutical technologies, you know, where we've got an Alzheimer's drug that's entering clinical trials. We've got a Parkinson's disease drug that's entering clinical trials. Uh, cosmetics, we have a, you know, Here's a, just a, a crazy example of some of the things we do. So one day we were looking at beetles. I don't know why, for whatever reason. And we were acknowledging that you know when a beetle grows through a process called sclerotization, it breaks its exoskeleton. And then over the course of a couple hours, it turns hard and dark again. And I said to myself, you know, this is a tyrosinase cascade. I wonder what would happen with gray hair. So we bought some gray hair, and we put it in the presence of a mimicking a, chem, a set of chemistry that mimics this process, and believe it or not, the hair turned dark. So me being the grayest person at the institute, I said, okay, well, let's try it on me. And essentially, it, re it restores the original color hair. This is not a hair coloring. It's not a hair dye. It actually restores human pigment. So if someone with black hair gone gray, and they put this in their hair, they get black hair. If someone had brown hair and it's gone gray and they put this in the hair, it's gone brown. It's now being, it was licensed as being sold. It's called hair print technology. And it's a non-toxic, environmentally benign way of coloring hair. That's another example. Third example, just to, to kind of illustrate the, the opportunities in green chemistry, have to do with paving roads. That interestingly enough, there's like a billion miles of road in the United States. And every year, we, we repave 10%. When we repave, what we have to do is we have to throw away the old stuff because the air and the sunlight has oxidized and made it brittle and not useful. And so we had this idea of coming up with a magic molecule that allows you to reuse that recycled material instead of throwing it away and to lower the processing temperature. So a, a week, a year ago this week, the people came to my house. I used my driveway at the game. Hey, if I'm going to put stuff in my hair, I might as well sacrifice my driveway. And at 17 degrees Fahrenheit with over 50% recycled material, we paved my driveway. The workers who came, there were 30 tons of asphalt with a, you know, a bit of our additive in it, and they laughed at me. They said, no way, John, is this going to work. It's too cold. There's too much recycled material. They opened up the back of the truck, and the pavement flew out nice, they paved it, and here it is a year later, and it's perfect. I had people from the Massachusetts Department of Transportation there with clipboards. It's now being inspected in several states, and this is a way of, of, of paving roads using high levels of recycled content at low temperature. Now, interestingly enough, the examples that I gave, the Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease drugs, the hair coloring system and the paving system, while you might say, gee, though, they're all over the place, they're all weird, they're not. You know, because all they are is they're all non-covalent derivatization looking at how particles crash into each other. Alzheimer is an aggregate of proteins that form amyl and plaques. Our molecule addresses that by disaggregating.
hair, the hairprint technology is having aggregates of, of melanin to, to essentially form these, these colored bodies that are brown, black, and we're controlling that. Again, non-covalent forces with aggregates. Obviously, pavement is sand and gravel that is wrapped around a polymer forming aggregates. And so although to the, from a distance it looks like these are all different technologies, from, this, from my perspective, they're all kind of the same. And I think that that's a key point, is to realize that nature, you know, they're all biomimetic technologies, provide solutions time and time again. And more interestingly, more often than not, they're more environmentally benign to both. But what really concerns me, is it goes back to this old slide, that still today, no universities, or not many now, some are, are requiring any demonstration of knowledge of toxicity and environmental impact. So the nonprofit organization that's on the, co-located called Beyond Benign is headed by Amy Cannon and Kate Anderson. And they have K-12 curriculum development in college and university. One of the most important programs they do is what we call the Green Chemistry Commitment. And what we're doing is we're asking universities and colleges, the, chem the chair of the chemistry department, to sign a document saying that over the next several years, they'll find a way of bringing green chemistry into the curriculum. And the dream is that one day, no chemist graduates without having some fundamental training in toxicity and environmental impact. And this, this program got announced about you know, a, a, a year, little less than a year ago, and already there's over 50 years universities have signed, UC Berkeley, University of Minnesota, and many others. This isn't an entire list. This is an old slide. But the momentum is going, and I feel that that is the, that is the beauty of the future, is that when all students are learning something about toxicity and environmental impact, we've got a place to go. You know, people often ask me, they go, John, what should we be working on? Should we be working on solvents? Should we be working on plasticizers? Should we be working on plastics? And, I, and, I, and my answer is always, well, if we train the scientists and we get the scientists to understand a little bit more about I impacts of human health and the environment of molecular structure, we don't have to pick the technology because we get them all. Because those chemists are the ones that are going to be working on everything. And the most important thing we should be doing is focusing on changing the world at the education level. Because those students will then work for companies, those companies will be more successful and more profitable and less toxic. So that's my background. That's my, my story on green chemistry. I hope that people on this call find this useful as a, as a framework for, for how to look at how green chemistry fits into academia, government, and industry. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate uh, the time and the, the historical context and the kind of the introduction to this concept, I think, for a lot of people in our audience that that by, might very well be a, a complete introduction for them. And I do want to encourage our audience, by the way, to submit their questions uh, via the Q&A box um, uh, at the bottom of the screen there, and we'll get to those in just a moment. Uh, John, I had a question for you. Um, do you think that the increasing number of green chemists might someday might <laughs> reduce the need for some of the environmental regulations that you spoke about? You know, it's it's interesting. It's always a I get asked that question a lot. Is green chemistry a replacement of the regulatory world? Um, no, I think that we're always going to need regulations, but they they might evolve into a different shape. You know, in that in that you know would you know would companies do green chemistry you know without regulations? Well, part of the cost benefit is coming up with technologies, you know, that aren't regulated. And so those regulations are important as a driver for all of this. But so, so I'm practical enough to realize we'll always need regulation. But hypothetically, imagine a world where we didn't because everything was safe. But again, I'm not so Pollyannaish to believe that that could happen. But yeah, in a way, if, if chemistry is, is safe and non-toxic, then it should be less regulated. And, that, and that's, that is the goal. Mm -hmm. We have a question from uh, Joan. She wants to know if uh, a copy of this PowerPoint slide uh, presentation will be available. Um, I didn't know if, if you were going to make that available, but I do know, Joan, that um, these webinars are recorded and they are uh, viewable at your leisure anytime, day or night, uh, through the Green Builder Media site. Um, John, I don't know if you were. Yeah, and if you send me an email, I can, I can help. 
make whatever specific information you need available available. Okay, and you can see John's email address is right there on the screen. Um, mm -hmm. So, Joan, I encourage you and anyone else who would like a copy of the presentation to to please uh, submit an email to his address there, and we'll leave it up there on the screen for a little while. Um, we have an email, or a, sorry, a question from our friend Jack Armstrong. Um, he'd like to know, what do you think are the best ways for industry to catalog the ingredients of products so people know what is in them? Uh, probably similar to what you see on the side of a, uh, a food box. Uh, do you think the risk and exposure here is still relevant, uh, like frame, flame okay. retardants and building products? All right, so let, let me be very heretical about this subject, because I am very heretical about this. Subject. I feel that we need to approach things very different way, that I, and I feel very strongly that we need to come up with a different mechanism. And so I have what I refer to as my three elements of safer chemicals policy. My first element is I believe we need to stop making lists of bad molecules and stop making lists of good acts and tests. We need to figure out what the tests are going to measure success. There's way too many unfortunate substitutions. If I make a molecule that's not BA, well, there's a lot of molecules that are not BPA. But if I were told, here is an assay, here is a test, I want a molecule that does well on this assay or test, then I can apply the scientific method, go in the lab, synthesize a material, test it. If it doesn't work, tweak it, go back and forth. But right now, just by saying, here is a list of the molecules, then essentially the next list is to be made of those replacements. And so we've got to stop making lists of messy molecules and stop making lists of good tests that we're going to use as criteria to measure success. So that's element number one. Element number two is got to stop focusing ingredients and start looking at final products. And the reason for that is you know, a product could have 75, 80, 100, 1,000 ingredients. And we're just arbitrarily picking two or three and saying, if these two or three ingredients aren't in it, somehow the product is now safe. Well, that's just not true. It's just ones that have caught our attention. And the, the resources required to testing all those ingredients is astronomical. Why not just test the product itself? Why not test the final product? You know, and if we've done element number one, and we've come up with these assays and tests, why not just do the final product. So if, you know, if I have a pair of pants, I grind up the pair of pants, and I sprinkle the pair of pants into these assays, and I say, you know, it got an 8.7 on the cancer test, it got a 6.2 on the neurotox test, it got a 5.3 on the global warming potential, it got a 6.2, and we have quantitative information of the final product because the, the problem is twofold. Number one, many ingredients vanish during the manufacturing process. They're not even in the product at the end. But more importantly, many molecules are formed during the manufacturing process that aren't in the list of ingredients. So there's very little relevance to the ingredients to the final product. So why not call a spade a spade and just focus on the final product? And then the beauty is there's no trade secrets now because we're not saying 2-chloro-5-hydroxy something something is in this product. All we're saying is this product scored the final the, this way. So it's element two is to move from ingredients to final products. And element three is let's report just like in food, when you look on the side of a food package, it tells you how many calories, how many grams of protein, how many grams of fat. It doesn't say good or bad. It just gives you those numbers. I can decide for myself how many calories is good or bad. I can decide for myself how many grams of protein I want, and good or bad. And so there's no controversy about what's good or bad. It just isn't. So why not just report that this product got a 7.2 on the cancer test? It got a 6.5 on the, the hepatotoxicity test. And the consumers can pick for themselves whether or not they want to buy that product or not based on that science that's being presented quantitatively. That way no one is playing God passing judgment on what is safe and what is not safe. We don't do that for food. 
And so why not have that? And so those three things in combination, come up with the right tests, start testing products, and reporting the scores of the tests in a non-judgmental, non-biased way, so that now the NGOs and the, and the organizations that are saying, don't buy a product that has such and such a, a, an ingredient in it, can continue to do exactly the same thing, but now say, don't buy a product that gets a 7.3 or higher on the AIMS test, you know, and give guidelines to consumers of what numbers they should care about. About. Now, when a, a, a company needs to invent an alternative, they've got very precise criteria. Okay, these are the tests that we better take while we're in the in the R and D phase, and they can save a ton of money by doing that. And so that those three are, are, are the way that I would approach this. I'm sorry, it's a long-winded uh, answer, but very important to me. Well, but you bring up a great point on that because certainly in in the building industry, we have seen. Uh, a lot of time and effort and money <laughs> spent mm -hmm. on fighting uh, chemical red lists, um, yeah. whether it be through lead. Uh, you know, I've heard people grumble about the uh, Living Building Challenge uh, mm -hmm. and and their uh, lists um, as well. And so yeah, yeah and and we it's 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 not effective, you know. It's not getting, getting us where we're because the thing is, is those lists, the number of molecules on those lists will stay constant because as we take some off, we're going to put some more on and take some off and put in. And it takes so long to come up with those lists and justify those lists. You know, there are you know so many molecules out there. There are far less products than there are ingredients. And so it just seems more common sense and practical. And then, it's, again, it gets rid of the trade secrets. Again, it, it's not now more relevant to the consumer. You know what what is in this product? Don't you know? Give me a a, a partial list of you know five compounds that a group decided was important, and ignore the other you know hundred molecules that are in that product. You know if you if you test the product, and then the cool thing is is that let's say the product gets a bad score. Now that company is going to want to disassemble that product to figure out what component is giving the bad score. But of course, they've got suppliers, and they would want their suppliers to have given them the same test results, so they would know before they made the product which of their components did that. And then those suppliers have themselves their supply chain, and they would ask the same information. So it gives an actionable process to weed out what's causing the bad um, the bad scores in a, in a process to get rid of them. But right now, what, what we see and we hear all the time, this concept of unfortunate substitutions, because all we're doing is saying this is a bad molecule, and so then we start the clock ticking all over again when we come up with the replacement, because we're not looking at the criteria of what makes that thing not good. We're just saying it's not the molecule that's on the red list, just not serving society. That's not the way to do it. So it sounds like a fairly cogent argument against the the red lists or even environmental product declarations. And and right now today it's the best we can do. All right, and so we can't just stop that because right now, what I've described would take years to do. We'd have to come up with committees that are knowledgeable to come up with what are the lists of of assays and tests, and so it's something that. Today, the best can do is have the red list because we know alternative. And so if we could start working towards a future that had this other process, that would go forever, right? Because if you think about it, if, if we have a big debate for five years about bisphenol A, well, once that debate is done, the next molecule, the debate has to start all over again. But if instead we say, here are the assays that we value for endocrine disruption, or this is the assay that we value for cancer, now we have that debate once, and we can always renew that list, because science is always evolving. And so I've been on so many of these red list panels, where a group petitions to put a molecule on the list, and another group petitions to take a molecule off the list, and it's this endless debate, and it just happens over and over and over. If we instead said, I petition, I want this assay, the AIMS test, to be the assay for cancer. Well, every year someone can say, well, you know, I don't really like the AIMS test because of this. Maybe we should do this one instead. You can have that same debate, but there's far fewer assays than there are 
molecules. And then the, the cool thing is if it then identifies where we need to do research. Because if no one can agree on an assay, if everyone is saying there is no good assay for such and such, well, maybe the NSF, the EPA should be applying some funding to come up with that assay. Because what I've found in my life is I'm sure, you know, it's always represented as this epic battle of good and evil. I have never met someone who says, yeah, my product's toxic, but screw it, I'm making a lot of money. I look them in the eyes, and I honestly believe they believe their product is safe. And the people that are saying that the product is toxic believe that that product is toxic. So both people believe in what they're saying, but one of them's wrong. And it's not a belief, it's not a motivation. One of the assays that they are trusting is not good. And until we start focusing on the criteria by which we're defining health and safety, we, we can't really go anywhere. And so we need to start focusing on that criteria and look at those assays and tests and start improving them so we can get to the point where we need to be. And just to be clear, that. Uh, or to, to define to the audience, assay means or stands for? Test. It's, it's, an, it, it's, a, it's a preferably non-animal test. Uh, enzymatic assay is you go in the lab, you sprinkle something on a, on a material, you, you process it in some way, and something happens to the enzyme or to the cell that predicts whether or not it's toxic or, you know, in, in some very specific way. Is it an endocrine disruptor? Is it a carcinogen? Is it a neurotoxin? And then these tests, you know, they, they exist. They're, they're somewhat expensive, but um, we need to come up with ways to make it more cost effective. But, yeah, so that assays are, are tests to evaluate the success. And so, you know, think about it. If, if I was asked to make a paint and someone said, John, I want you to invent a paint for me and I want it not to fade, I can't invent a paint that doesn't fade. They, I have to ask them, what do you mean by not fading? Because if I put that out in the sun for 30 years, it's going to fade. So then they say, no, okay, it's not that it doesn't fade. I don't want it to fade more than 10% density over 15 years at such and such a sunlight. Now I've got a test. I can go into a box. I can put the paint, can shine light on it, and I can measure if it faded or not. If it fades too much, I can go back to the lab and invent something better. But with toxicity, if we don't have that assay, I just invent something, toss it out, put it in a product and wait a few years to see if people get sick or not. You know, that's not the way to do this. You know, we've got to have these assays be part of the design criteria. That's what green chemistry is all about, is inventing the safer materials at the design level. But you can't design without a test to let you know if you've done it right or not. So we've got to agree on what those tests are. I appreciate you sticking around beyond the hour. And uh, you're okay to, to take a couple more questions? Sure. Okay, sure. and Sam, I promise we'll get to your question in just a moment. I wanted to stay on this topic for just a moment um, because it is it's such a big and important topic, especially to our industry. Um, I thought of two, I don't want to say counter arguments, but two points um, that, that challenge the, uh, the, the topic that we're just talking about here. The first mm -hmm. is the judgment, okay? Right. Uh, who or how do you determine uh, like you said, on a, on a hypothetical cancer scale, uh, is 7.2 good, bad, or in the middle? Uh, with calories, with cholesterol, with uh, uh, sodium, we can understand or at least have a general understanding of, because we go to doctors or we read and learn, uh, if that's good or bad for my individual health based on the set of criteria that I have. Maybe I have high blood pressure or maybe I have low blood pressure or whatnot. Um, mm -hmm. So the the judgment of what's bad or good, because you wouldn't be going to visit your green chemist every year to get a checkup, and then also the campaign. Uh, I, I've got to think it's a fairly substantial campaign to raise public awareness to, okay, here are these scales, here are these numbers, here's what they mean. Um, but but right now the the problem is is we're inundated that one group says that this causes cancer this is going to kill you this one so who do we believe who do we trust if, if, if it's a black box someone is just saying I'm going to take care of you this is bad this is good whereas if you have the the, the evaluation now the thing is is that we could also be looking you know this, this concept of generally regarded as safe we as a society 
at least believe that an apple from the state of Washington is probably safe or, you know, an oak leaf from, you know, some tree in Maine or something like that, we would, if you treated those with the same assays, we would find that zero doesn't exist, that everything that we interact with in our life has a non-zero number on all of these endpoints. And so then if I saw that, you know, this pair of pants got a 7.3 on the cancer assay and this other brand of pants got a 6.2, now I have criteria for which one I want to buy. And oh, by the way, the oak leaf got a 4.5. So that gives you some kind of relativistic understanding of what we're, we're dealing with. And so that's what I, that's all I want is to have an, an actionable thing. And I, and I would argue that there is no doctor telling you to buy food with 270 or less calories. That we are not given that prescription. We're just told eat less calories. And we go and we make a judgment, okay, if you're getting ice cream, there's going to be a lot of calories in ice cream. You may want a less, less calories in ice cream, but you're not comparing ice cream, you know, to a rice cake or something like that. And so it's the same thing. There's a judgment, and it's, and it's in the same work that's going on right now to educate whoever on what purchases they should make. It's exactly the same amount of effort and time and, and everything else. It's just now it's actionable. It's not a black box. Here is a list of, of nasty materials and molecules you should avoid. It's here is why you should avoid them. It's more factual and more scientific. And I just, I just believe that the, the, the market will embrace that and use that as criteria for inventing alternatives as opposed to just coming up with a replacement that's just as bad but not on the list. Gotcha. Well, no, this is, I mean, this is a great topic, and I'm sure yeah. us and, and the audience can at least spend a long time mm -hmm. talking about this because it is such a, uh, uh, a topic of, of importance and also mm -hmm. relevance and timeliness as well. Um, yeah. I did want to get to Sam's question, though. Uh, he wanted to know if you had any comments or thoughts or if you knew of any research about industrial hemp and its application in green chemistry. Um, as a biomaterial, there's, there's, there are some papers and some, some things out there on, on you know, a variety of different biomaterials and fibers and things like that. And so absolutely, I'm sure that you know, there's, there's probably a, f a few dozen papers where people have, have, have come up with that as a replacement for some synthetic fibers or things that don't need plasticizers. So uh, it's not my field, so I don't have a lot of, of off the top of my you know, head examples, but I know I've been to conferences, I've read journals that have, have discussed specifically that. So yeah, there is some work out there. I wouldn't say there's a huge amount, but there's definitely some. Uh, also, I had a question for you, uh, two more, and again, I'll, I'll make kind of the last call for questions from the audience here. Um, you were showing the recycled asphalt driveway that you have. Um, yeah. I'm curious, is there a way uh, you talked about coming up with a test and that sort of thing. Is there a way to change the color uh, to reduce urban heat island effect? People have been working on that. And the, the, the problem is, is that, from, and I'm not an expert of everything that's been done, but every time you change the color, you hasten its degradation. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. Uh, is is that that the, the the black surface is less reactive apparently, and that when people put pigments or things into lighten it like titanium dioxide, oftentimes those those lightening agents actually catalyze the degradation of the process, and so that's that's the catch twenty two. So far, and that that's the way it was explained to me. Again, I'm not an expert in this field, but it was explained because because yeah, if you could just make things you know less absorbent of, of thermal energy, that would be great. But apparently, you know, the the catch twenty two is that everything that does that shortens the life so that you have to repave it more sooner. Gotcha. Uh, <laughs> final question yeah. then uh, from me because I'm not seeing any more from the audience right now. Um, those schools that you listed there at the end of your uh, talk, mm -hmm. um, I apologize if you to cover this, but did they just add one class or did they add an entire degree? Okay, no, so my philosophy is that every university and school has to do what works for them. If one university wants to have a standalone one semester class, great. 
have a standalone one semester class. If one university says, no, we're not going to have a standalone class, but we're going to integrate it into organic and PCAM in such and such a way, then that's great too. If another one says, gee, let's put it into the labs, I want whatever a university does to work for them to work for them. And that all if 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 these universities now are posting their strategies and one university does it one way, another the next university can look at that and say, gee, what that makes sense for us and people don't have to reinvent the wheel and can and can share best practices. So it would be presumptuous of me to say this is what people should do. Given a choice, I would rather have a standalone one semester class. But you know, that's just me, and i do not not presumptuous to believe that I have some gifted insight that that's the right way to do it. I would do it that way, but universities should do whatever works for them, but just make sure that no chemist graduates not having this, that information. It's really kind of startling when you think about it. Doctors, lawyers, teachers, nurses, architects, they can't practice their trade when they graduate. They have to take a test, right, and they get a license, and they have to maintain that license throughout their career. There's no equivalent in chemistry. Okay, in chemistry, you graduate, you go to work in industry, you invent a material, potentially making the most potent neurotoxin in history, and you've never had a class to predict or understand that. And it's kind of interesting. And so going back to the policy discussion, if I was a company and I wanted to do best practices in sustainable green chemistry, rather than focus on the materials, I'd focus on my workforce. And I would say to the world, we are committed in that 20% of our workforce every year on a rotating ba basis is going to have a class of mechanistic toxicology and environmental mechanism so that all of our designers, all of our scientists are always at the top of their game for knowing what the latest knowledge is in toxicity and environmental impact. And then by ensuring that they being trained, all of our products over time are going to improve. And, in, and stop focusing so much on, the, on the, the materials and focus on the people making the materials. And, and what could be better if, if, if a company said, yeah, well, that's what we're going to do. Uh, and if, I, if I had a magic wand, I'd, I'd have that happen more often. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on today of all days. Um, I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Um, I did want to take one more opportunity to thank our sponsors, uh, Owens Corning and the Green Builder Coalition. And I also want to thank the audience for their questions and their time today. Um, we very much appreciate your participation. This was our final installment of the Impact Series, Game Changers in Sustainability for 2014. But don't worry, we'll be back once the calendar flips over to 2015, and we'll hope to join us then. From everyone at Green Builder Media and everyone at the Green Coalition, we hope you have a safe, happy holiday season. Until next time, take care, everyone.